October 17, 1989, the earthquake damaged Cypress Freeway propelled a forgotten Bay Area neighborhood to world attention. By the 1980s, West Oakland was a place most people passed by. But for almost a hundred years, it was where they stopped. All tracks led to West Oakland. In the 1870s, hammers, nails, and hope converted a quiet pasture land into an energetic town almost overnight after Oakland was declared the final link for America's first transcontinental railroad. Ideally located directly across the bay from the port city of San Francisco, West Oakland became a transportation hub, and for better or worse, transportation would mold and define it until the present day. In the wake of the freeway collapse, yet another change is coming, and with it, the end of an era. The new freeway will cut through these railroad yards, removing many remnants of the industry that once transformed and sustained West Oakland. The people, however, with their hopes and their memories remain. This is their story. We ate out of the garden, because my father raised cabbage and he raised uh, corn and everything, you know. We had Italians, Portuguese, Slavonians, Austrians. You can hear the trains blowing when they come in, especially one point, when they get to a certain point. You knew that train was on its way in, and everybody knew what, some people knew the number. The, oh, here comes old number 17. <laughs> this was, uh, was the first point of arrival. Uh, it was the Plymouth Rock from the south. It was here in West Oakland that Central, then Southern Pacific established a huge rail complex. Ships couldn't dock in West Oakland's shallow water, but that didn't stop the brazen engineers who had cut through mountain ranges to link the two coasts. They built a pier extending two miles out into the bay. All lines led to the West Oakland Yard, which serviced trains and tracks throughout the Northwest United States. The yard drew workers from across the sea and throughout the nation. As a very young child, I uh, remember there were uh, an, an extraordinary number of Irish, Italian, Portuguese, German people who lived in West Oakland. There was hardly a day that went by that we weren't conscious of our identity as Americans of Greek descent. It meant a lot to us. And the other thing was that everybody had an identity like that. There weren't too many that you uh, ran into that were 100% English or Scotch or Irish, you know, from the British Isles. Turn of the century America opened its doors to a huge flood of European immigrants. Those who reached West Oakland rubbed shoulders in the crowded flatlands and staked their claim to the town the railroad built. Local canneries and shipbuilding sprang up, and together, the newcomers carved out a thriving working-class world of their own. But many were seeking something more, another kind of belonging. My mother and father went to night school, as did so many other immigrants. They were studying English for the specific purpose of learning to become uh, American citizens through the naturalization process. My father used to go to the court on his day off when the court was open and watch the proceedings because he was getting ready to be examined. And there was this one fellow from Yugoslavia that he used to, my father used to talk about who did very well on the federal level. And then the judge says, now I'm going to ask you something about state government. He says, okay. He said, uh, who runs California? He says, Southern Pacific. <laughs> and my father told that story many times after. And I asked him when he first told us, well, what did the judge do? And did the judge get up? He said, oh, the judge laughed along with the rest of us. <laughs> 
For years, Southern Pacific dominated California's economy and its politics. Its reach extended throughout the state with a particularly firm grip on West Oakland. SP railroad lines from across the West converged at the ornate 16th Street passenger station. SP tracks continued to the mole on West Oakland's pier, where streams of commuters and transcontinental travelers took the daily ferries to San Francisco. And along West Oakland streets, SP's red electric trains competed with the key system to carry local passengers. But SP provided more than transportation. It provided jobs, thousands of them. And in no place were the jobs more concentrated than on the stretch of land off Fifth Street known to everyone as the SP Yards. And they had a lot of workers working in the roundhouse where the, the trains would come in and go around to get cleaned up and come out. They take them over a pit, and the mechanics who work in the pit are underneath. It's oily and uh, watery and noisy, a very tough job. My, da my dad's job was called a truck man. The truck is the bed of wheels on which the locomotive rests. And uh, his job was to maintain that. Oh, I worked as a delivery boy. See, the SP is almost, the SP Railroad is almost like a city. It has all these shops. They have a laundry, and they have a sheet metal shop. They have all these shops for maintenance of their own property. That's the building I lived behind. And then when these passenger trains would go by, we'd hear them coming and we'd run out of the back door and jump on the fence. And the fence was so broken down and ready to fall over anyway. The momentum of the train going by, it was kind of back and, and we'd get a swing with the fence. My father was a Pullman porter. And what they used to say, he, he ran on the road. That was the slang that they used. Black people who worked for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters were really sort of the, the astronauts, as it were, of the black community, because they were the ones that left the black community and ventured out into the broader world, and then came back to tell stories about who they saw, who they met, what they heard, what they learned. And, uh, and my father was a part of that tradition. One Sunday morning, the phone rang about 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. And I heard my father say, OK, I'll be right down. And I jumped out of bed and asked him what was going on. He said, well, they want me at work. I said, you're a senior guy down there. Can't they call somebody else? They ought to be giving you some, you know, breaks. I said, you know what? In the future, why don't we have somebody else answer the phone on Sunday morning? And we could tell him, oh, he went fishing today. He's not available. He got upset. He said, my boy, I want you to remember one thing. All through the Depression, when so many people lost their jobs, they never laid me off. And I'm, I've never forgotten that, and I don't want you to forget it. When the depression was coming, then they got start getting all these layoffs. Cause we'd get a, a, a cablegram from the main office saying we're going to abolish gang number 22. All the gangs had numbers, you know. And I'd see this coming, and I'd say, I wonder where I'm going to end up on this deal. So then on Sunday when we played ball, the, the store department they all they went to the ball games. So when the game was over, I went to the head storekeeper and I said, Mr. Concan, and I said, you're going to lose a ball player. He says, who? Says, Me. Why? I said, I got laid off at the B&B department. He said, hey, you're not getting laid off. You come and see me Monday morning. I went there Monday morning and they gave me all my seniority back and everything. And I worked there for 46 years. So I got my job back through baseball. Most railroad workers clung to their jobs during the Depression, but one group put theirs on the line, the Pullman Porters. Along with a small number of lawyers and doctors, the Porters were West Oakland's black elite. With few work prospects available for black men in 1920s America, most Porters were overqualified for the position. 
The Pullman Company offered a chance to travel, but little else. After years of long hours, low pay, and no job security, finally, they rebelled. In 1925, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters began organizing for better working conditions and union recognition. They kept up the struggle for 12 years until 1937, when the Pullman Company admitted defeat. It was the first time a major American corporation had recognized an all-black union. The charismatic A. Philip Randolph led the charge. His vice president was West Oakland's own C.L. Dullums. I realized very early on that C.L. was a special person because whenever I would tell people my name, the first thing they would ask me, are you related to C.L. Dellums? He was a success model in my life. He was an immaculate dresser, uh, smoked a pipe, he had a secretary, he had an office, the things that I saw in the movies, but none of my friends had uh, such a person who was real and alive in their lives. In 1982, C.L. Dullums recalled the conflict with the Pullman Company and its resolution. And the man who was the head of the Pullman Company was named Champ Carey. I guess his name was Champ, that's all we ever heard. And he said to Mr. Randolph, would it be an imposition for me to ask for a conference, Mr. Randolph, with you and Mr. Webster and Mr. Dellums? And he said, now, let's be frank about this thing. Here was a handful of colored people. Negroes got together here and took on the Pullman Company. You know the Pullman Company is one of the most powerful industrial institutions in the nation. How the hell did you figure to win? Well, uh, Mr. Carey, uh, we've thought about it a lot. We've talked about it a lot. We got to serve ourselves. <laughs> How we won, he said. But I guess I guess we could summarize it by saying dedication and integrity. against overwhelming odds with all the money and everything else, this tiny little union emerged and changed the course of history in America. The people of West Oakland had helped make national history. They would soon make a contribution to world history. And at that particular time, at the beginning of the war, there were, they wanted brakemen, they wanted firemen, they wanted conductors, and they were running ads in the paper. So I answered an ad, came down here to West Oakland, hired out, and made my date as a qualified locomotive fireman on September the 6th, 1941. It was, it was a real, real challenge to run a steam engine correctly. It, it had an almost human response. If you delicately balanced the throttle with the reverse lever and had the engine talk back to you properly, that engine knew you were doing a good job, and you knew you were doing a good job. During the war, we would see trains, you know, with soldiers passing, you know, going to, going to the Pacific, you know, and we would see them full of soldiers going on the train going to the end of the railroad tracks where they would be put on boats to go overseas. Then, little by little, we started to hearing that they were contracting people from Mexico as braceros to come and work in the railroad. And uh, that's how my husband came. The bracero, they, that's what they used to say, arm and the arm for United States. Bracero, that they needed their arms to work in the, in the railroads. And my husband would clean outside of the trains when they would come in and did a lot of things, the maintenance of the trains before they would go out again on the road. The big impetus during the war was to move the freight. Lots and lots of trains in and out. The uh, shipments were supremely important at that time, of course. Uh, valves, pipe, steel plates were all, of course, uh, absolutely necessary. Uh, we had to have a steady flow. For two shipbuilders, James Moore and his brother Joseph, 
The trains in and out of the SP yard were crucial lifelines. As owners of West Oakland's Moore Dry Dock Company, it was their job to deliver supply ships for the war effort. There was tremendous pressure from the Maritime Commission and the Navy to get their ships out. Trains brought Joseph and James Moore essential raw materials. Trains also brought them the people whose labor would convert those materials into ships. The trains would bring the porters from the south, and the porters would go back and tell them, California, that's the place to go. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands were, dra were drawn to the Bay Area because of the knowledge all over the country that there was a great deal of shipbuilding. The war changed everything. The thousands enticed to Oakland by the promise of war-related jobs would transform the city, especially West Oakland, as thoroughly as the first transcontinental railroad had some 70 years before. Working class white ethnics who lived in West Oakland at the time began to move out, and West Oakland became the major port of entry for black people coming from the south into the Bay Area in search of new opportunities and jobs as a result of the war economy. And overnight, uh, West Oakland literally, the face of West Oakland literally changed. I wasn't dumb enough to think the streets were lying with gold like they'd always told us about California. But for real, uh, all we had seen of California was in the movies and in books and read about it in picture and history and what have you. I was excited about it, but when I got here, my feathers dropped. I said, oh no, it was so drab and the weather was ugly. And I said, oh, I don't think I'm gonna like it here. But Tippy Alexander Jones and other women did like the work being offered, thanks to A. Philip Randolph, C. L. Dullums, and others. Their threat of a march on Washington had opened up federal defense industry jobs to black men in 1941, and women followed soon after. They were accepting men and women as well if you wanted to do that type of work. And there were a lot of women that went to welding school. Well, I was a welder. I learned to weld, and I went through that little training school, and I learned it well enough they made me a tacker. You have your helmet and you have your rod welding rods in your hand. So you would have to maybe walk up second deck on a ship wherever they would send you to weld. It was hard. It was a lot of, it was hard work. But once you got used to it, it came easy. I worked the graveyard shift. So when my job was finished, I would have to take my line out, wrap it back around my shoulders, lug it back downstairs and go home. The neighborhood Tippy Alexander Jones came home to every morning had changed drastically since the outbreak of war. By the mid-1940s, African Americans were becoming the majority population in West Oakland. Many newcomers from the South brought with them beliefs about home and community they set about realizing in West Oakland's house-lined streets. To longtime residents, the newcomers seemed too aggressive, too ambitious, and too willing to challenge the way things were. Well, we were used to owning our property, if you could. Everybody strived back home to own their own property, their own land, their own this. They knew the real value because they, that one time they didn't. Everything that you would need, a grocery stores, blacks owned, had jobs, and they had places of employment and places to do, but there was commercial activity. Because I had this paper route down 7th Street, I can remember, although I can't remember every place, but I can remember how vibrant 7th Street was on both sides. I can remember uh, little cleaners, you know, meat markets, grocery stores, liquor stores, uh, furniture stores, you name it, you know, pharmacies. Um, I can remember uh, people walking down the street laughing and, you know, feeling good. Even though I was, quote, economically poor at the time, uh, I didn't think of it. We didn't think of ourselves as being poor at all. 
You still thought you lived in a culturally rich environment because there was the security of so many people and you had success and role models adjacent to you. And when I shine shoes, I shine the shoes of the few black lawyers, the preachers, the Pullman porters, the longshoremen, the gamblers, the hustlers. One of 7th Street's best known hustlers was Slim Jenkins. Slim had been so broke when he left his native Lake Charles, Louisiana, that he had crossed the country stowed away on Pullman coaches with the help of his porter friends. But that didn't stop Slim from thinking he could start a business when he arrived in West Oakland. When Slim decided to put his a supper club in, the Oakland police were so sure that Slim was going to uh, uh, start another crime world here in West Oakland, they put barricades across the street to keep Slim from opening up. Uh, but he got around it, and then the next thing we knew, all of the big shots were coming to Slim Jenkins because of the reputation that Slim had acquired. He did a 360-degree about face to develop one of the finest clubs that has international recognition. And Slim Jenkins was like the Cotton Club. It was a, a place where there was a lot of fun, and there was a lot of activity. There was dancing. There were people where men were meeting women to pick up women. There was a place where people would go, families would go there to have fun as well. And there was a place where famous singers and performers and nightclub acts uh, came. When I was working at Slim's, this fellow would always come in and ask me to do Ace in the Hole. So my organist, she didn't know it. She couldn't play it. She says, I can't play that. I said, OK, well, I'll do it a cappella. You don't have to play it. I said, <laughs> so when, when uh, I did Ace in the Hole for this guy, and I did it without the music, he came up to the bandstand, and he handed me $100. And you know that was a great thing in my life. He gave me a $100 tip for doing that number. The money may have been flowing into Slim's, but elsewhere in West Oakland, it was drying up. The Moore brothers and their workers had contributed over 100 ships to the war effort, but peace slowed, then halted the demand for ships, and the yards eventually closed down. One after another, factories abandoned West Oakland for the wide open suburbs. And as post-war Americans began to fall in love with the automobile, their romance with the rails faded. With cars and trucks on the road and planes in the air, it wasn't long before the SP yards began to slow down, too. Southern Pacific started closing down a lot of their uh, jobs, you know, the blacksmith shop, the warehouse, the, the supply house where they used to supply paper towels and things like that for the trains that would go out. It started shrinking and shrinking Southern Pacific. Once the dominant force in California, Southern Pacific was now only one of many players. The Bay Bridge, opened in 1936, became the workhorse of Bay Area transportation. Ferries out of West Oakland stopped running, and the growing volume of car and bus traffic doomed the interurban rail system. In West Oakland, the electric key and red trains disappeared, and the tracks were torn up. Soon, 7th Street began to get mighty quiet. More and more and more cars. More on our roads than last year. And there'll be more next year. And the year after that, more and more cars will be built and more cars will be bought. It wasn't long before America started building highways at a feverish pace. In 1955, plans began for construction of a highway through West Oakland, leading to the Bay Bridge. The Cypress would prove convenient for many throughout the region, but not for West Oakland. When the Cypress Freeway came in, this is the kind of housing that existed. Most of it looked like these Victorians. There were some cottages, like the small one there, and there were some classic boxes. But most of them were like these Victorians, and, and there were some Queen Anne's. They came through and just wiped that housing out. 
the folks who lived on this side of the freeway sort of start thinking of themselves as, hey, you know, we're this part of West Oakland and someone else is that part of West Oakland. In 15 years after the construction of the Cypress Freeway, another transportation project came to West Oakland. BART would help reduce the dominance of the automobile in the larger Bay Area, but in West Oakland, it would have a profoundly negative effect. The BART overpass killed 7th Street because they totally lost continuity. And from there, I think things deteriorated. Nobody wanted to go down there. with that thing right in, going right over their head all day long? No. This vacant lot was a drugstore, a pharmacy, and a soda fountain. It all happened right here in this little place, and it's been vacant now for years. But this was the, this was the barber shop folks used to go to. Why were you pointing it's, out the tiles? Oh, give me sort of like the tile is still there, and that's, that's all that sort of remains, you know? I'm shaking my head, you know, because I get stuff like a flood of memories and stuff. This place used to look good. Damn. These houses have looked like this for like five years or more. But see, this is the stuff when I say people see problems and I see potential. It's like, I don't know who lives there, I know who lives here, but if it's a senior, and then through some of the city of Oakland's rehabilitation programs, we should be able to go in and do something, you know, to, to help fix up the house. West Oakland's problems and potential confront each other block by block, house by house. Like when the community came together to rebuild the earthquake-devastated home of longtime resident Martha Booker. The first day that we said, let's go down and clean up, and we didn't know how many people were going to be here. 200 people came here, including my state senator, Nicholas Petrus. He was here. And then on Saturday, when everybody could come down, we would actually get together and raise these walls, you know, and hold them up, and then they would nail them down. And I could lift that wall up and stand there and say, we won, we won this. For the people of West Oakland, victories have never come easy. But as they look to the future, they can draw inspiration from the stories of their parents and grandparents and strength from the history of the community they built.